In this week's update, there remains a large market divergence. What has been consistent in 2022? Central bank policy has caught the market unawares, but it's not all doom and gloom. My name is Gary Davis. As always, this is general advice, and please remember to like and subscribe to the video. Let's start with the normal market reality. Look, it's it's been a really tough market um, pretty much all, all this year. We've had a couple of rallies along the way, which, which are normal. Um, it appeared that the strength of the rally coming out of mid-June was sufficient uh, to indicate that the, uh, the bear market was over, um, and certainly the money flows back to the more aggressive sectors uh, strongly suggested that. Um, but the market ha has, had, uh, has had other ideas, and frankly, it's because the Fed did something that hasn't happened for a couple of decades, and it really did catch the market unawares. But the messages that I've been sending all year have remained consistent, um, in my view. Uh, what I've said along the way is that markets, and this is pretty much from the start of the year, that markets would be volatile um, in 2022 and, and probably quite divergent because with, um, you know, with a 40-year a, uh, reversal in interest rates and, uh, and bond yields, um, there was always going to be an enormous amount of adjustment and disruption and so therefore, it was going to affect different parts of the market uh, to different degrees. And we've certainly seen that happen. And I'll, um, I'll show you a relative comparison chart of, of US sectors in, uh, in just a minute. Obviously, the mega trends, which I've been banging the drum on for probably three or four years now, have lent enormous support to this divergence that, that's occurred. And you know, frankly, I, I don't, if, if a sector, if a stock is not in a sector that's in a clear and unquestionable megatrend, I just pass. I, I don't own anything that isn't in um, an undeniable megatrend and, and haven't done for several years. Focusing just on the indices, as many people do, because that's what the media talks about and that's the easy way out, it's just to look at the, the index. Um, you're going to get confusing, misleading messages, and I've been at pains all year to highlight where the money flows are going on an intersector basis, because that's really what you want to know. If you're in a if you're in a bear market, then money is flowing away from the aggressive sectors. If you're in a bull market, it's flowing into the aggressive sectors. So if you want to know what kind of market you're in, you can't just look at the index because we've seen the index fluctuate up and down uh, quite dramatically, once in March, once in April, and against, again in June. Quite um, substantial uh, fluctuation. So if you're just looking at the index, the, the chances are you're just not getting the correct message. Something I've been saying to members forever, but certainly in, in this forum, is that you've got to get clarity around what you're doing in the market. And in my experience of you know 20 years of being an educator, um, a very, very small percentage of people ever sit down and actually do the work properly to get clarity around their plan. And, um, and with a very volatile and very divergent market that's, that tests your psychology, then you've just got to have clarity around what you're doing. And I guess one of the most important things is if you follow the news, you're dead. You really are if, you, if you're trying to trade the news because the market is a forward-looking beast and you've, you've got to be paying attention to where the money is flowing if you want to know how to position yourself in the right way. And the other thing that I've said since um, probably since 2021 is that the greatest risk was that central banks made policy error. They either didn't raise rates soon enough or they raised rates you know, too much or they, you know, they make too abrupt a shift. And that certainly is what is playing out now with Jerome Powell at the Fed. Um, and that is, the, that is the risk to the market, and that is why the, the market has reacted so badly in the last uh, two or three weeks since, um, since the Fed announcement, because it just got caught unawares. The, the market didn't believe that the Fed would, would take the extremely aggressive stance that they've now taken. It's, you know, it's been 
waiting for it for years and years and years. And time after time, the Fed backed off. You think about 2018 when Powell tried to um, tried to raise uh, interest rates and and um, and tighten uh, liquidity, and the market fell substantially in that fourth quarter of 2018. Um, and he backed off. You know, they the market stared him down, and and he backed off. And so the market didn't believe that the Fed would take the position that they they now are. And so that's. Um, you know, that, that's the risk. The risk is that the central banks in the pursuit of taming inflation tighten too far, too fast. Looking at things fundamentally, which for me is a second order factor, but nonetheless has a degree of importance. The UK economic situation is an absolute mess. Uh, they really are. And the bond market is forcing a huge shift in policy and you know, the, the UK, the new UK government, very unfortunate for the new prime minister, is very, very much on the back foot. And, um, you know, the bond market is going to dictate there what uh, what happens. And we saw the last time, um, a couple of uh, decades ago, when um, when the um, the UK central bank tried to take on the, the market and, uh, and lost badly. So... The situation in the UK does have the potential to create global instability. So, you know, I I would never position myself on the basis of what might happen because it's just not the way to go. You trade what is, what's in front of you. But certainly I've got one eye on the UK situation because if that were to really get nasty over there in terms of disruption to the financial system then clearly that has a flow on effect for everybody else. So there certainly is the potential <clears throat> for that to happen. But that is one to watch, not, in my view, not one to actually uh, react to at this stage. Headline inflation is still rising around the world. That's headline inflation. In America, in, um, in August, it was up 8.3% year over year. In Europe, it was up 9.1% year over year. I forget the number in Australia, but I, I think it's something of the order of 6.8 or something of, of, along those lines. If we look at the Fed, as I said before, the market wasn't prepared for the big shift that the Fed has made. For decades now, their focus has been on protecting asset values. That's why Powell v- backed off in 2018 when the market fell heavily. But they've now shifted their position from trying to protect asset values, try to hold the stock market up, you know, hold the housing market up. And now they've they've gone completely the other way and they're looking at trying to tame inflation. And they're um, publicly saying, if we have to, we'll drive economies into recession to do it. So that is a radical, radical shift. And that's why the... um, the rally off the March lows, uh, off the uh, June lows, I should say, has failed. And particularly during the week, we saw another leg down in the US market and the indices finished quite badly on Friday night. The uh, the PCE, which is the main indicator that, uh, that the Fed looks at, uh, personal consumption expenditure, was up 2% versus the 1.5% expected. So any numbers that are coming in now above expectations are, uh, are drawing a fairly poor reaction from the market because you know expectations have turned quite bearish. So anything that's even more bearish than that is not being viewed very well. So the bottom line is, however, just having said all that, so that's the fundamental case. And if you only looked at the fundamental case, then you'd probably just want to slit your wrists and, um, you know, and, and go and lay down and die somewhere because it's all pretty dire at the moment. But there's always fundamental light ahead. We've got substantial divergences on a sector basis. There are still wonderful opportunities and, and wonderful performances, you know, in Australia. Um, some of the stocks, and I'll come back to this, some of the stocks did extremely well. In uh, in September and in the um, and in the September quarter, as a whole, so it wasn't just one month; it was across three months. So th- there are places to um, you know to to profit handsomely, but equally there is a lot of places you know where you can you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. So there is some fundamental light ahead, and these are 
that some of the inflationary drivers are weakening. The pace in which they're rising is slowing down or it has already turned over and is coming back the other way. So, you know, that's that's at least a start. Consumer inflation expectations are falling. So the, the way that the consumers see inflation and what that does is it eases the pressure on the central bank policy because they the central banks don't feel as though they need to raise rates as quickly. Um, you know, or as um, you know, to tighten as uh, as fast and as far as as they might otherwise do. There is a good case that U.S. inflation has peaked. There's a number of indicators. I, I won't um, bore everyone with each individual detail, but certainly there is a good case could be made that inflation has peaked in the U.S. And you've got to remember that the Fed has really only just started tightening significantly, so that has not had a chance to have an effect. So it may well be that the Fed actually pauses to see, you know, if, if they continue to see uh, evidence that, that inflation has peaked, they might just pause for a, a few months to let, let the rises they've made so far have an impact. So, you know, it's not all as, as bad as the media would have you believe now. And right now, bearishness is so extreme that a reversal becomes a distinct probability because that's just how markets work. You know, when, when bearishness is at an extreme, then so much of the selling has already been done and the smart money then starts to look at, well, what's been oversold? It's just the way that the market works. A bit of a stat that I, uh, I read um, recently when the S&P is down more than 7% in September, then 83% of the time, and this is over the last uh, five decades, 83% of the time, October rose by an average 4.3%. So look, this could be, you know, the odd year when it, when it doesn't happen, but the stats are heavily in favor after such a rotten September, the stats are heavily in favor of October being positive at the index level. And with so many stocks and sectors so oversold, um, you know, we, it's there's going to be plenty of stocks that are going to do a heck of a lot better than than um, than 4.3 percent. Again, that's just how it works. All right, before I go to the American stocks, let me just show you a chart. So this is the relative um, performance on a sector basis in the U.S. and and this pretty much dictates what happens around the rest of the world. And it just makes it starkly obvious where the money has been going. So look, I'm sorry this is a bit of a jumble. I hope you can read it effectively. But starting from a common base, 12 months ago, the energy sector has just been the, the clear standout outperformer by a country mile. Then we come down the line and it's pretty much as you'd expect. The next is XLP. So Consumer staples have outperformed, which is a more, def you know, obviously defensive sector and healthcare. So they're the next in line, but they're a long, long way behind energy. And then we get XLB, which is the material sector. And this isn't too bad, actually, because this includes gold, which has been, you know, just a terrible performer. Then we've got the S&P, uh, the green line coming in there and then underperforming the S&P, We've got uh, finance, we've got consumer discretionary and bringing up the rear is technology. So, you know, if you wanted to own a portfolio full of technology stocks or you wanted to own a portfolio heavily overweight energy stocks, it's pretty obvious you know, how you would have performed on a relative basis. Let's look at those sectors now. This is XLK, finished the week poorly and the outlook is... Um, you know, is, is pretty sombre for technology, not helped by the fact that uh, Apple has come off very heavily in the last two days of the week. Um, but I think there's a very good case for the fact that, um, uh, you know, Apple, Apple has been downgraded by a couple of brokers and the market is in a negative frame of mind and is reacting very badly to that. But when you look at the actual numbers, not a lot has changed at Apple. So I think the realisation will come you know, fairly soon that, that uh, you know, Apple's being treated inappropriately. 
This is energy, so 200 day moving average, still rising, the price just a little bit below it, but um, it, it's likely that we're just gonna continue to, um, to head to the upside in energy. This is uh, finance, you can see it's just broken, uh, broken support. So that's, uh, that's not a particularly good picture. There is um, uh, consumer discretionary, obviously Amazon being down, Tesla being down has not helped. Um, so that's, that's the US on a sector basis. The S&P end up, ended up down 2.9% for the week. It was down 8% for the month of September. Um, and, and they're interesting numbers, but I, I always dig much deeper than that in the options market, which is really important because it's telling you where the money flows are going. The, the put to call ratio is now at an extreme, which is typical of major lows. Now that doesn't mean that we'll now immediately get a major low, but it's, it's typical of the sort of levels that you, you know, it's like the VIX, you, the VIX spikes up and it doesn't stay above 40 for very long because it's just too extreme. People, people's psychology can't handle it. And there's always bargain hunters in the wings. So these sort of extremes just don't last very long. And the put to call ratio is at one of those extremes right now. And there's also the, the sector ratios, as you'll see in a minute, you know, it, it's hardly exciting, it's hardly bullish, but it's not completely negative. There is a little bit of hope there, as you will see. Looking at the um, the currencies, the index eased back a little bit. It was 113 uh, last weekend. I think it might have touched 114 during the week, but finished down 112. The 10-year yield was higher to 3.83, did actually get a hit four, I think just over 4% at one stage, and that's why technology um, and consumer discretionary have been hit so heavily. The VIX didn't really kick up in the last couple of days. It, it was pretty much around the 30s to the low 30s throughout the week. So we're getting a, a bit of a divergence between the VIX and what the index uh, did over the last few days. And the two-year, 10-year spread uh, was up to, uh, or it improved from around 0.5 to just under 0.4. Not that that... It's not really here, neither here nor there. Sorry, let me just get that chart up. Right. So let's take a look at, first of all, we look at the NASDAQ. Get rid of our time clock. Okay, there's the NASDAQ. We've now, it's only, it's only minor, but we've now um, gone below the June low and closed right on the lows. So if you look at that NASDAQ, that looks pretty ugly, you'd have to say. And if we look at, uh, if we look at, this is the, um, the COVID crash lows. Um, we've got a little bit of leeway here because there's a couple of, there's a bit of a band of support here. So we haven't actually got through that yet. Um, if we look at um, the small caps, the Russell, Looking pretty similar as well. 200 day moving average clearly pointing down. Shorter term moving average is pointing down. Hasn't yet broken either the June lows or the major support level either. If we look at the S&P, um, you know, clearly the S&P broke on, uh, on Friday, broke the June lows and closed emphatically uh, on the lows. And, but we are coming up on another key support level. So, you know, this is not an unimportant support level and uh, that's sitting at, um, at 35.76, so quite close to that. But let's take a look at the spread charts um, because, you know, this is what's really important. This is the NASDAQ versus the S&P. Um, and yes, it turned down on Thursday and Friday, but it was, you know, things weren't too bad prior to that. And it's still really in a, just a little consolidation. Now, it can, from here, it can really go either way. So I have no, um, no particular uh, leaning that way at all. 
this is um, the uh, Dow Jones small cap growth versus small cap value. And I find this is a very surprising chart. So this is a, a little bit of um, a little bit of a glimmer of hope that um, small cap growth stocks did so well into the end of the week compared to to value stocks. That's quite a surprising chart. Uh, this is on a weekly basis, large cap growth versus large cap value, pretty neutral. So not as bad as I would have thought. Discretionary versus staples came off a little bit, but again, not as bad as the S&P looks. The S&P looks awful. But when you look at where the money flows are going, there is there is certainly not a stampede out of aggressive sectors into defensives like we saw in December and January and February. And therefore, you know, if that's the case, then there is, you know, there is some hope for the market. This one is not good. This is semiconductors versus the S&P still underperforming. And, you know, this one still bothers me a little bit. However, there are a couple, you know, this is influenced heavily by a couple of major semiconductor stocks. One is Intel. And Intel has just been a shocker of a performer. Uh, it's a major contributor to this index. And it's a, you know, it's a company in, in significant difficulty. Whereas the rest of the semiconductor sector is actually traveling fairly well. The other one that's been under pressure is Taiwan Semiconductors, which is the, I believe, the biggest semiconductor stock in the world. And, you know, they're under pressure for pretty obvious reasons being in Taiwan. There's a heck of a lot of geopolitical risk there. So, you know, this this may be sending us a, a bit of a false signal because in the semiconductor sector, there are some stocks that are actually not doing too badly. And this is uh, mid cap. So mid cap versus the S&P, mid cap growth, I should say. Um, you know, and this is like this, the small cap growth. This is staggeringly positive. So that's why there's, I say there is, you know, there is some hope at the end of the, of the, uh, the tunnel as far as, um, <clears throat> you know, as far as what happens in October. And, and October following a poor September is typically, you know, not, uh, not a bad performance. So if we look at the currencies, the US dollar did come off a bit the last few days. That that did help gold. Um, but if we look at uh, the Australian dollar, um, the Australian dollar finished, as you can see on Friday, just awful. Despite the fact that the US dollar came down, the US uh, the Australian dollar should have gone up, as as it did on the two prior days. So if we go back to the the US dollar and, and currencies are having an enormous impact on monetary flows, not only in the currency market, you know, the, the impact of these currency movements is, is directly affecting stocks, both fundamentally and, and, uh, and technically. So you can see the US dollar was down Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So you would expect the Australian dollar to be up. And it was Wednesday and almost Thursday, but Friday was a shocker. So, you know, that one is, um, is very, very surprising. Turning now to, um, to the Australian stocks, our dollar, 63.3, so it's, uh, it's right down there. And the next stop for our dollar is, um, is just a tick under 60 cents. And, it's, and given the move on Friday, it's pretty hard to see us not getting to that level. Now, the ASX 200 index, it fell another 1.5% for the week. Uh, materials, again, was the outperformer. Uh, the best quarterly performers um, on, stock, on a stock basis, coal, um, battery materials majors, energy, um, you know, that, that was where the, um, where the benefit was in, um, uh, in the quarter for, uh, for the Australian market. Sorry, let me just take a quick look at all right so sorry I just want to get to look at the Australian market so that's the ASX 200 
pretty negative finish. We had a strong Thursday, but then that all got washed out on Friday. And you would have to expect that we're going to see probably at least a gap, a significant gap down open on Monday morning. Just, you know, just the the emotional reaction to what the US did. But um, I think we're going to see some some parts of our market start to perform quite well in um, in October. All right, this is um, US dollar gold on a weekly basis. So we actually hit a low last week of 16.15, but it managed to rally and uh, and finished at 16.61. So we've clearly broken support. And this is a bit of an undecided candle. So I'm not, again, I'm continue to not be excited by by gold. And um, and if you look at the last couple of days, we had a, we had a great Wednesday in gold, but then Thursday and Friday quite undecided, really pretty much closed where it opened. So not a lot of um, not a lot of attraction there. But if we look at um, if we look at GDXJ, so these are these are global um, global um, large, large cap in a lot of cases. They're not the mega gold miners, but there's still a lot of large cap. Um, gold miners in here, such as Northern Star Evolution Mining, would be included in this index. And you can see it looks pretty dreadful. It's been trending down for a long time, but at least the last three days um, were, uh, were not too bad. And there's a, there's a very, very good reason for, um, certainly for that in Australia. Um, so 17, uh, 1662, um, but in Australian dollars, we're at 26.25. So Australian gold miners are entitled to be doing very well. Now they're not, but um, but really they're from a fundamental point of view, they're um, you know they're making very handsome profits. But the market's just not interested. So finally, a bit of fight on a global basis, but um, yeah, nothing to uh, attract me into that market. Looking at other commodities, copper was pretty much steady around 3, 344. Nickel was down about 50 cents. Um, and there is a short term rise in copper inventory. So that that's not helping, as we'll see in a minute. Crude oil was higher um, to 79.74, but not a lot in it. Um, and um, we've got, um, you know, we've, we've got a medium term correction happening in, in crude oil, if you look out over the last three, three months or so. So there's the, um, the one year spot copper chart. There's the inventory. So there's been a kick up in inventories um, during September. And I'm not quite sure what that's about, whether it's got something to do with what's happening with uh, excluding Russian metal from the, from the, um, uh, from the tradable market. I, I really don't know. It doesn't really matter. Um, but that's, um, that has kept a little bit of pressure on the copper price. But if you look out to 2024, 2025, the, the outlook for copper is extremely robust. And there's the one year nickel chart, as you can see, ticked down a little bit. Um, but in the case of nickel, the, um, the warehouse levels have not, uh, have not turned up. So I'm not quite sure what's behind that, that turn up in copper inventories. So to wrap it all up, Shares still look positive. If you're looking out 12 months, then shares still look really positive by this time next year. It's really very, very difficult to see, you know, even the indices not being significantly advanced from where we are now. And some individual stocks will do very, very well. The bear phase will conclude, quite obviously. It always does. The market goes up about 80% of the time. And some stocks are going to rise now and are rising now anyway. Um, you know, and we've just seen a very, very good quarterly performance from, um, you know, quite a decent handful of, um, of Australian stocks. Wonderful buying opportunities are presenting. They will continue to present. Always been the case, always will be. So investors that are, who are locked into their view of the market, which is just based around the index, Sorry, folks, but you just you're in the wrong game. You're looking at the wrong things. You've got to be looking at where the money flows are going, and there are terrific buying opportunities. So the most important commodities, as I've been saying all year, keep an open mind, have a clear plan, 
and the opportunities will be there to cash in. Portfolio analysts last week, we looked at doing some hedging, hedging to smooth out portfolio fluctuations using ETFs. Um, and, you know, there's there's um, a number of things that you can do there just to, you know, get you through these sort of rocky little patches. We also looked at graphite and lithium stocks in Australia. And, uh, you know, there's some very, very exciting stories there on a long term basis. So that's it for this week. There's more information on the website. There's my email address and I'll be back with you next Sunday. Cheers. <music>